Jesus Christ in and through the Eucharist. And so starting in 2020, and with the release of Corpus Christi, we began with a three-year movement. We're calling it a grassroots movement. It's not a program. It's about a time of reawakening amazement in the gift of the Eucharist. And the first year of 2022 to 2020, what we in the diocese described as working the ground. Any of you gardeners here? That you have to do some work in the soil to give the seeds the best chance of growing. And so that was what the first year was. I called that the diocesan year. And during the diocesan year, we met leaders across the state and some work with them. But at the heart of all this revival is our own personal relationship with Jesus Christ and the presence of Christ. So yes, we could talk about all the things as leaders were doing the program. And again, it wasn't supposed to be a work. It's a grassroots rep effort of how the Holy Spirit is working in us. And in that, spending time with each of the leaders in communities. And those leaders could be everyone from the person who organizes the different events that appears to the pastor, to whomever the pastor invited, is to really reflect on what does it mean to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. To recognize the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist and what that did beyond gathering the mass. And so that first year, like I said, was helping the leaders kind of bond themselves in that relationship. Now this year, starting with Corpus Christi in June is what's called the Parish Year. And these are, we've seen different things happen in the years, the glimpses of God in the glimpses um, of grace uh, newsletter that I'm going to post today, but also it's parish is going to focus on this time, particularly on adoration and the present, of different ways that we're called to recognize Christ in the Eucharist, celebrated, received. Adored and lived. Sometimes because people ask the universe to, to just the mass. And that is part of it that hopefully from this time this evening, you'll see that it's what this looks called the source and summer, and maybe we can talk about that a bit more. That it is about the human mission out into the world, which will be the final, the third year of the formal National University of Revival, which will be from 24, 25, and then beyond, that we are part of the mission of um, experiencing and encountering Christ in a real way, in a way that adheres that out to the world that is in such need of the love, mercy, and grace that Christ has for us in the hands of Christ. That means that what we have sound yet? Working on it. All right, then we'll Pro more. Proceed. Proceed. All right. So the last thing I'm going to tell you before I can invite you to keep is that one of the, the things that's going to happen as part of this National University Revival is there's uh, the first in 83 years, so it's the 10th National Eucharistic Conference. It's going to happen July 17 to 23 in Indianapolis, Indiana. It's, you can get tickets, there's all kinds of information for that. We're trying to get the village together. Um, and it's, it's tough talking with somebody who feels much more like we're, we're working with Italians than proposing it as it's like, oh, it's coming. <laughs> Just be a little more relaxed. So um, hopefully we'll have more details about that program soon if you'd like to be part of that. We already have 30 people from the diocese who are planning to go. So we um, have yeah, actually this discount. So please watch your parish board and do check the diocesan website for those opportunities. So as you can figure out, as I said, we're trying to record this. So just to let you know that, um, there's going to be some times when people ask for responses. So to know that those will be recorded, um, we're going to share that with the diocese. I always want folks aware of that. Um, so, 
the reason he came this evening was to spend some time reflecting on what only you can do at last. What no one else can do when they come together from us. And I am thrilled to introduce you to Vicki Klima, who came to us from Minnesota. That's where she and I met. We used to work together for their studies. This is St. Paul in Minneapolis. She had been a director of the Office of Worship for more than 20 years. Okay. Um, and she has a master's degree in pastoral theology. Um, but also, she worked in Catholic high school. She worked in churches in various roles. But more important than that to me is that she's a deep woman of faith who took her love for God. For our shared prayer and liturgy, for learning, and for the people who come together to pray and liturgy and channel it during the pandemic to put together a resource um, that she was able to publish in a book called Participation of the Heart Before Engagement in the Mass. And so she's actually doing three presentations for the church for minister there on stage. She did one this morning. Then for tomorrow, and here it on Sunday. But she said, you know, I can do a presentation in the evening. And so here we are. For her to help guide us in our reflection of what only each of us can do with us. So please join me in one way. Thank you so much for coming. I admire the fact that you're good in your Friday night. Uh, although when I was working at all those things, I didn't go out much on Friday night because I was collapsing from the work that I had done all week. Uh, Saturday night, a different story, but usually Friday night I was too tired to do much of anything. But thank you. I'm thrilled to be here because I'm thrilled to be talking about this subject. And I forgot my paper. Wouldn't you know? So this is going to be a talk about the Mass and about how to engage ourselves more deeply in the Mass. And hopefully, You'll get some new ideas tonight. We'll see. So the first question that I'd like all of you to think about is why do you choose to go to Mass? Because it is a choice. You would not have to go. But I have a feeling that everybody in this room is going to be able to answer the first question, but not the second one. But there are people, of course, who choose not to do it. Now, I'm just going to be quiet for one minute, not longer, while you think of your answer or answers to that question. This is a little bit complicated because of how we're sitting, but I'd like you to share the part of your answer that you feel comfortable sharing with one other person. And if we have strays, we can be a group of three, but no more than three, because I'm not going to give you a long time to do this. Uh, but so you might have to turn around a little bit. We'll do this maybe four or five times this way too. Won't be too bad, I promise. Okay, so you have some answer. Tell it to at least one other person. Even if you have to move a little bit.
constitution on the sacred liturgy. So that is going to tell us what the church says the purpose of Mass is. And this is paragraph 10. The liturgy is the summit, the high point toward which all the activity of the church is directed. And let me just mention, Lori said this a little bit, but um, mass is a liturgy. So don't get confused by what we're not using. There are more liturgies than just mass. Because the ritual that we use for baptism, the ritual we use for marriage, and a whole bunch of other things are liturgies. And we're going to look at the really at the mass tonight. But this document is talking about all of our liturgy is the high point to which we're directed as a church. And at the same time, it is the fountain that springs up and it's where our power, power of the church comes from. So the liturgy gives us the high point that we're trying to achieve and the fountain of the church's power. For the aim and object of what we do in our lives is that all who are children of God, and when we become children of God because we've been baptized, that we should come together to praise God in the midst of his church, to take part in the sacrifice, and to eat the Lord's Supper. So from the liturgy, grace, I love this sentence, grace is poured forth upon us. And the liturgy is the source for achieving these two things which are very, very important. The first one is human sanctification. The second one is God's glorification. And those two things are the end, the end to which all the church's activities are directed. So what's the purpose of Mass? Well, there is more purposes. But the high point purpose is for us to give God glory and for us to grow into sainthood. Let's look at God's glorification first. And I think it's the easier of the two to understand that we come together and give glory to God and we have the saint of our glory to God. Uh, the Mass gives glory to God through the prayers rituals, the music, not just the words, but everything we do and see and say, because it comes through the five senses. And we are learning things that sometimes we don't even know we're learning, because we don't realize, we don't take the time to kind of think about it. We know that God is glorious. We know that God is worthy of our praise and thanksgiving. We acknowledge the great works that God has done. I think you probably have heard somewhere along the line that the word Eucharist means thanksgiving. It is our thanksgiving to God. As creator of the universe and source of every gift, God is deserving of our adoration and praise. So all of the prayers and everything we do, it's built in that we're giving glory to God. Now, let's see if you can do this by heart, because if you can, I'm just going to leave it. The Lord be with you. In your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. He's right and just. There you are. We do that every time we come to man. We say it is right and just to give thanks to the Lord our God. And before we change that about uh, a little over 10 years ago, it is right to give him thanks and praise. That's the longer version. But now we just say it is right and just for saying it. It's good. Now, 
I hope you also listen to the next line because in almost all cases, the next line is, it is truly, the priest says, it is truly right and just. Our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give God thanks. So that's a pretty good uh, confirmation of the fact that we are there to give God glory. Now let's talk about human sanctification. And I have to tell you that I gave a talk. Oh, we touched the microphone. I have to tell you that I gave a talk uh, to a group of lay people from a parish one time who got really mad at me for saying that they were all called to be saints. Me? Come on! That's for nuns and priests. It's not going to be your little old me. Well, it is for the little you and to be working toward holiness. That doesn't mean that now we're going to change our lives, we're going to stand on the street corner, hand out uh, pamphlets, tell people the end is near. We're not going to do any of this We're going to do this in the middle of our regular lives. Because we've been baptized, even as infants, we are committed to discipleship and called to holiness. Through faith, you are all children of God in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized in Christ, every one of you, have clothed yourselves with Christ. That's a quote from the letter to the Galatians. And this is another document from the Second Vatican Council, Lumen Gentium, that came out a little bit later. It says, it is quite clear, it might not really mean that, but it's supposed to be quite clear that all Christians, in any state or walk of life, doesn't matter, all Christians are called to the fullness of Christian life and to the perfection of love. And by this holiness, a more human manner of life is fostered in the earthly society. So I'm sorry to tell you that you are called to holiness. But don't get overwhelmed, okay? It's not as bad as you think. Because holiness is in the, in the actual meaning of the word is to be set apart for God. That we have a real relationship with God, we give God thanks, and we come to God for help. We were created out of love by God, for service to God, and to one another. It's not just a me and God situation. It's me and God and you. We are members of the community. All ages, all walks of life, all vocations, all careers, all income levels are called to do this. And we move, okay, we move from selfless, selfishness to selflessness. Think about a baby. Okay. The baby is thinking, well, I know, you know, mom and dad were up pretty late last night, so I'm not going to create a fuss today. I'm just going to be really good and I'll wait for them to think about food and think about holy meat and all those kind of things. Is that what the baby thinks? <laughs> the baby has needs, the baby knows he or she has needs. And they're going to make that known by what we call wailing, <laughs> crying, sobbing, weeping. So we are born 100% selfish. 
And that's a good thing because it has to do with our survival at that point. Our job, our task, is to move to 100% selflessness. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen all at once. It is a long process that we hope gets a little deeper each year of our lives as we look back. Because that's our aim. But as I said, don't be overwhelmed because God does not expect it to happen overnight. But we want to be working at it. And in case you're wondering, I think the thing that might be wrong. I think I have about 12%. So I got a little ways. But God knows that I'm trying. So just one more look at the fact that this is for all of us, that we in our very vocation seek the kingdom of God by engaging in regular life, that's temporal affairs, regular life. And we are trying to get them in order according to the plan of God. We live in the world, in each and all secular professions and occupations. We live in ordinary circumstances, married, single, whatever. Doesn't matter. And our social lives, from which that's part of existence. What well, the relationships we have to those around us. We are called there by God that by exercising our proper function and led by the Holy Spirit, that's part's very important, that we can work for the sanctification of the whole world. Because we are level, least. And we are going out into the world, this is from our baptism, we are going to go into the world to be the feet and the hands and the voice of Jesus today. And as I said, we are all called to that. So how does human sanctification happen through the mass? Okay, this is kind of a weird thing, so I hope you get this. But what we're talking about is kind of the circle of our lives. It's not the hour I spend with God at mass versus the rest of my real life. You see people who say that sometimes, they don't usually don't say it that one but it's something that some people kind of think of. God life, real life. No. They flow from one another. So that during the week, I have all sorts of experiences. Some are good, some aren't so good. Um, I might get sick, I might have somebody who know who's sick. Um, really tragic things may happen. Or, but whatever happens during the week, I bring with me to something. And I say to God, I give it all to you. I give you thanks for all the good things, and I ask for your help with all the things I need help. I ask you to be with me. And we give ourselves to God. And that way, is that at Mass, God's speaking to us through the scriptures, obviously, but also through everything that we're doing, every prayer, every song, every ritual, every gesture, they are all teaching us something. And I'm going to tell you more about that as we go forward. But that's what we take back into the week, and we say, I'm going to try again. I didn't do so well last week, baby, but I'm going to try again today. 
be Christ in the world. I'm going to try to be nicer to this person. I'm going to try to help this person. I'm going to try to give up my grudge that I have against this person or the anger that I feel. I'm at least working on it so that week after week, this is the circle of our lives. Bringing everything to God and taking God that with us out of the world. But with that, I think we need to realize that the circle is not quite enough. It's a spiral. Because as time goes on, it goes deeper and deeper into our lives, into our hearts. Are you the same person you were a year ago today? I hope there's been some growth. I hope you're seeing things a little bit differently, maybe more mature. But whatever it is, we change. And that's good. Unless you change to be a little older person, that's not good. But we're talking about changing and becoming more like Christ. Fulfilling our baptismal commitment. Does this kind of make sense? That's also part of what makes the Mass so important. And that's the way we learn this holiness by everything that we're learning at Mass. Now, what does the Church say about participation at Mass? Because we need to participate in order for all these things to happen. So, probably the most quoted of all of that document on the liturgy from the Second Vatican Council is this first sentence here about how Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful be led to fully conscious and active participation. And those things are demanded by the very nature of the liturgy. We're called to participate. Full, active, conscious participation. I can't even begin to tell you how many articles since 1963 have been written about those three words and about how we're supposed to be participants. I'm not going to tell you all that. But the, the real thing is to realize that. This full and active participation is the aim to be considered before all others. Wow. Participation is important. It is the source from which we derive the true Christian spirit, and therefore we need to be taught how to participate. I'm very old. And I was around before the Second Vatican Council. And I think there might be a couple of you who are, who also might be known that. Mass was different. It was very different. It was in Latin. And it was, um, people really didn't explain it to us a whole lot. I mean, I went to Catholic grade school, so I learned a lot there. But did I necessarily remember it? Uh, it not. I was in you know, second grade for first communion. But the mass before the Second Vatican Council was really pretty passive for the people. There was some participation, and there was some, there were some parishes that were more advanced than others who did more, but we all brought a small minister with us to church. I can say Joseph was a who had a minister. No, I have. Aha! Okay. It had the Latin on one page and the English on the other. Because there really was a desire that we know what we're saying, that we are able to do the responses in Latin, but that we knew what they 
We knew what the priest was praying. And we weren't just listening to Babel, but that was in the middle. But I will also tell you, and I was in Catholic grade school, you didn't get yelled at if you really weren't paying very much attention. You can pray the rosary during Mass. You can think about other kinds of things. Pray to God. You can do all sorts of private prayer in a room full of people. And nobody thought that was a bad thing at all. But the second kind of counsel is talking about real participation. That we are doing all of the parts. And they're all verbs. Praying, singing, responding, assessing, listening, standing, sitting, kneeling, shaking hands, eating, drinking. We are participants in what's going on. There was a liturgical pioneer from the early part of the 20th century, his name was Virgil Michael, and he wrote about how we needed to start praying the Mass. Not praying at Mass, because that's what we were doing. We were praying, but we weren't praying when the priest was praying in the Mass. We learned our responses by heart. Sometimes we even took them for granted. And that was our participation. But the new kind of participation that we're talking about, and it really, I said it's new, but remember I said that Virgil Michael said that in the early part of the 20th century, way before the Second Vatican Council, he already knew we needed to participate more than we were, or at least most of us. So this participation that we're called to do is both outward, all the stuff you can see, and inward. The stuff that's going on inside of us. So what is participation? First of all, we're engaged in the mass, bringing the mass, and doing all those verbs I said. We're also working for the reign of God in our midst. That's part of our, uh, what we are told to do. We're living as Christ in the world, taking care of the poor and the sinners. We're living no longer for ourselves, but for God, but for God. These are all inward kinds of things. We're hearing the word of God and letting it take root in our lives, understanding it and hearing the scriptures. We're meaning it when somebody says, God in Christ, and we say, Amen. I agree. This is the body of Christ. This is the blood of Christ. In fact, every Amen joins us to the Paschal mystery which is the high term that we use to talk about life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. We participate in Jesus' life and death and resurrection. We are part of those things. That might be a big concept to try to get, but just take the word for it this way. We are working on it. We haven't necessarily achieved it. But how do we measure how engaged we are? How much I participate in? Well, here's the deal. Sometimes you're participating a lot better than other times. Did you ever go to Mass and you were distracted by all sorts of things? You were distracted by Worrying, anxiety, fear. This happened during the week. That's awful. What am I going to do about it? How am I going to solve it? We're maybe distracted about a good thing that's going to happen. We can't stop thinking about it. It just keeps coming up. That's okay. That happens to all of us. So what I do is either in the car, because I'm alone, which I usually. If I'm alone in the car, I 
And once I get into the church, I say, I say, God, I am going to participate today to the best of my ability today. I am going to offer you my best. My best might be really crummy, but that's the best that I have today. I'm going to try to listen. I'm going to try to be open to God's word. I'm going to try to be as aware as I can be. This is something that I don't call inner or outer. Public participation of the heart. Because I made a decision that says I'm going to participate to the best of my ability. My heart is here. My brain, my mind, my work center might be all over the board. But my heart is here. Where we are. And I'm going to do the best that I can. It's really about making an intention. I'm going to participate to the best of my ability. So, what does all that mean in my daily life? Well, it means being open to God teaching me something. And that's what I'm saying about how the Mass can teach us. But, it doesn't always teach us right there and then. Because we need some help with it. And I'm going to tell you about that in a minute, but there's one more thing about participation that we have to talk about. And that's the participation of all of us gathered together. It's what we call the primary ministry when we go to church. It's the ministry of all of us gathered together. And the individual ministries, readers, servers, sacristans, ushers, preachers, Eucharistic ministers, whatever it happens to be, they flow out of the community, the assembled people. I hope you've seen before where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am in the midst of them. I am not a student of philosophy, and I don't go around uh, all the time reading Kierkegaard, but I did read one thing, because I speak liturgy, and I think it can open up your brain. Kierkegaard said, I'm paraphrasing. You can, if you want to, think about the mass as going to a play. And you're out here watching. Most of the important stuff happens in that here, in the, in the sanctuary, at the altar. And the important people do their things up here. And we watch, yes, we sing the responses, we sing the songs, but we're kind of watching what's going on. And we're very good at being the audience. Because we're the audience all day long at all kinds of things. Football games, all sport games, concerts, um, everything that we do of that nature, going to plays themselves, going to musicals. We're watching. And if, if they decide to do something interactive with the audience, we send it back. So we don't get called back. Here the guard said, Well, you're not the audience. Everybody that comes to mass or, or helps behind the scenes at mass is a member of the gathered assembly. And we are all participants. The liturgical specific tasks are 
done by various people. But the main thing is to remember the primary liturgical role, liturgical ministry, is the ministry of the assembly. So if you want to think about the Mass as a play, you can do that. But you've got to think about everybody as being a cast member. The audience is God. Does that make sense? That was an eye-opening thing for me. I hope it might be for you as well. Although, then half of you are doing that. I'm not, I'm not, that's good. But keep that in mind. So, let's just think for a moment about what good it is to have a community of like-minded people. Now, we're not alike in every way. We have lots of different opinions, lots of different backgrounds. But we're all here because we love God. We want to give God glory. We love Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done for us. We're open to the movement of the Holy Spirit. We have that in common. And that's the important part. That's the important part. Is that we have that in common. Let's take a minute because I'm tired. Let's take a minute to think about that question. What good is it to have a community of life by people? Well, it requires for a minute, a minute, a minute, a minute, a minute, a minute, a minute. In that same group of two or three, share part or all of the answer that is in God. The person that they're with gave just an excellent answer. And maybe they have a little to share. How about you try first? Okay, she's pointing at you. Oh, you're pointing at you. You can pull it out. Did you all hear that? I don't have to repeat the okay. It's helpful for the back and speaking for it. Okay, you go ahead. Yeah? Oh, she said we had a good answer. And, and um, as we do that, we it's easier to love uh, as a different community that we're all like we're not having heads. Right. It's easier to grow when you live like one of the How about a couple more? Oh, but I was asking if, if she had a good she did. Yes. And you said that it's really nice when a lot of things are brought out of it. It's like most of these people are sports teams and those things that you normally have every day, like you say, that consumers. This is the thing that's so much bigger. And those things kind of fall out. This thing that we're doing 
it is so much bigger than the things that divide us. Oh, I'm from this team and you're from that team and you know, all the different things that we're not like-minded about. They get superseded by what we're here for and by having this community with us. Any others? I want you to say later on tonight. I wish I could say. Yes. Oh, one here and then. Okay, when you're with like-minded people, you can be true to those kind of things. You can be true to your values. You can say things you might not say in other places. Is that what I heard? This one first. I, uh, I just want to mention that now that the parish has requested the church, I think it's bringing more community together. Because I go to Mass every day, and I see the people that I go to Mass every year and night. And they make me do trips from the St. Kate Tower, the St. Thomas, the St. Mary, you know, to find out that you're all gathering together every morning, you're pretty much sitting in the hospital and everything. And uh, when someone's not there, they're this, and you're concerned, and you're gathering people from all of these because the attention is going to be all fast So it's just a great idea. So he's talking about how it's good to have a cluster of parishes and attending different ones because you're meeting some new people. And really key, especially that daily mass, you notice when somebody's not there, and you say, what hope are all right? And isn't that nice to have a group of people who notice when they're not there? That's a wonderful thing. Wonderful. So, um, I think you said one more thing that I got. Or am I not? Okay. That's good. Those are great people to meet you. Ah! And it's one of those things, yes. And then there was one final one, right? No matter how different we are, we are working toward the same goal. Now, here's the thing that is the most difficult about trying to learn things how we pass. It's a little bit of a There we go. Did something about it. Just hold on a second. I did this. Hmm. Okay, I guess I'm doing this slide next. My kid is my best friend. Okay, that summary so far. This is very important. Everything doesn't always go exactly the way it does. Yes. <laughs> So what have we talked about so far? We've talked about the purpose of man's God's glorification and human sanctification. We have not gotten all overwhelmed by that. We have talked about we've talked about how we participate in mass, that we're going to have, we're going to try to be engaged inner and outward and participation of the heart. And we're recognizing that the primary liturgical role is one we all have as we are gathered together as a body of Christ. So I just thought we hadn't far enough, so I needed to summarize. Now, to the problem we have, which is, hey, what is, huh, how can 
can I listen to all the words that I said? How can I, how can I wait for something to come into my brain from all these words? I don't have enough time. I don't have enough silence. You might have some time and some silence. But to really reflect on the experience, to reflect on what's heard, it's not all that easy. And we can't, let's say the the father is in the middle of the university prayer, and he says something that strikes us that we've never thought about before. It just comes and says, oh wow. So we say, Father, stop. I gotta think about this a minute. Good idea. Bad idea. Bad idea. Don't do that. But that's why. I would say we need homework all. We need homework. Because we've got to do this outside of the mass. We've got to reflect on the mass in our private prayer so that we can understand it better and get more out of it when we come to it. And the first thing to do has to do with the because that, of course, is the Word of God being proclaimed. The beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the Word. So my recommendation, and I'm about to say something that you're going to say, and she's nuts, don't have that kind of time, but my recommendation is that sometime during the week, you read the readings before Sunday, and you think about them. And if you don't have time to read everything, you read the other one. You get gossip. Maybe have a little uh, booklet that you've got from somebody that has a little commentary, or even discussion questions, so you can think about what's coming up. Then, when you hear it, on Sunday, and when the homily is said, you're open to get more insights because it's not just brand new words. You've had some time to think about it. And then, guess what I'm going to say next? You read it one more time after this. So that what you're thinking, what God is saying to you, comes back to you again. And you think, oh, that's what God is trying to teach you. How do I put that into my life? Now, the book that Laurie talked about that I did during the pandemic is kind of the culmination of years of work in liturgy and these kind of talks with various parishes. And so I came up with a book that pretty much does two things. One is that it gives us some background on all the parts of the Mass. Not all the scriptures, because that would be a book we did. But it gives us information about all parts of the Mass and reflection questions. Questions that help us to understand not just the words, but the gestures posture, the symbols, the ritual, the actual music behind the words. And I have found methods in the book, I'm not going to talk about them a lot, uh, but just so you know. And you can have more than five if you come up with your own. Whatever works for you is right to get the benefits of the normal. But the five that I have, I've just put down a little, a little bit about what they're called. But they have to do with how to take the words or the action apart, and how to think about what it means, what it's teaching me, and what it means for life. How do I take this into my regular the rest of my life? How do I do more? So we're going to do, uh, uh, yeah, we're going to do two examples. The 
first one we're going to do quicker than the second. But the first one we're going to do is the sign of the cross. One of the rituals that we do at Mass, we do it a number of times at Mass. But, look at these questions. When did you learn the sign of the cross? Who taught it to you? Where and when do you see people make the sign of the cross? How often do you make the sign of the cross? Do you always say the words in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit? Think about the answers to those questions. Some of them are family, right? In most cases, then how old were you? <laughs> it's one of the first Christian gestures we make. But, okay, let's think about it. What does that mean? What does it mean that the instrument of Jesus' death is something we sign ourselves with? What does it mean to take up your cross, follow me, and what is your cross? And do you think about that as a type of faith? Think about that and we're going to share. But if it's too personal, make something else out of it. I don't want to make anybody tell something they don't they can't hear me tell. Talk to the person, my person, to answer what does that mean to take up the cross? We're going to hear three answers. So who's willing to give us their answer? We're going to hear two answers. Because we have a lot of time for it. Anybody willing to share? Yes. The meaning is clearly now something that you maybe have taken for granted. Maybe. Another? Yeah, the family that prays together stays together. We have to say the word for you, we might have to suffer, especially if you're going to be But I can tell you, we all live in the time. <laughs> it 
exactly. So uh, in his family, they pray the rosary together as a family that prays together, stays together. And the sign of the cross, of course, was taught to all the children and it was part of that experience. Do we have one more or should I move on? One more, yes. And you can say that's how we move the dad out of time. But really quickly, I've come to feel that the cross came to this community. And if the cross can be one day and it's a co-worker on a new struggle with it or whatever. But for me, the cross I pick up every day is to love that and to, to give you our self-love. You know? So that cross is the cross I think I share. You know, we can sell it up. We will all have crosses in our lives. People we don't get along with, or situations where things are not going the way we want, loss. We will have crosses. But we are talking about we got the cross from the cross of Christ. And that's the one that we're trying to pick up and carry that cross. Just a short meditation that might help us. Think about the sign of the cross as a reversal. Over and over it comes from the door of the church before baptism. Through each morning and night at bedside, each Sunday in the assembly, and then to the anointing of the body in sickness and in the night. Sign of the body for burial with that same cross. What are we rehearsing? In that cross, traced over and over, we are learning the very shape of our lives. Knowing or absorbing little by little how for us. That cross is the weapon against evil and the victory over death. This is not just a matter of theology because it's part of our muscles, our body, our whole person. That's a quote from a liturgical writer who's in the state of We're going to do one more together, take a little bit more time with it. And just to put it into context so you know what we're talking about, we've been through the liturgy of the Word. I know it went fast tonight, but we have. And now we're starting the liturgy of the Eucharist, the second part of Mass. And it starts with the preparation of the gifts and altar. Does that make sound familiar? Do you know what part of Mass I'm on? Um, in this parish, or if you're in another parish, how does that procession happen? Just think about it. How does it happen? And what do you think is the meaning of breaking the bread and wine to the two? Can you share that answer with your buddy? You put it there? Okay, let's do that now. One more moment.
some parishes, because of the pandemic, uh, don't bring the gifts forward. What happens here? Do they come forward? No? Are they right up here? I mean, okay. Before we had COVID, what happened? Okay, the gifts were some that were back there. Some people were chosen. They brought them forward. The priest and or deacon came down to receive them servers, and then they went to the altar. Now, I bear a couple of new runs on another couple of parishes you may hear that are different from also. Um, but, and I, I hope that someday we'll all go back to that because there is some special meaning to that. And we know it's a special meaning because we're not doing the most expedient thing. Because the most expedient thing, the most expedient thing, would be to put them on the altar before Mass starts. And the second most would be to put them on a table and bring them over and eat them. But under normal circumstances, we might do that for daily Mass. We don't do that for Sunday Mass. We have some people bringing them forward. Who do those people represent? Oh. Every one of us. They are chosen usually often by the ushers, uh, or you might have to sign them for it, but they are represented all of us. I want you to think with some slides just a little bit about where the bread and wine has come from. And I have to thank the internet for this because I'm a farmer. I don't know how this works, but we have to grow the wheat. We have to start with the seed. It has to germinate. It needs a certain amount of water, a certain amount of sun. We don't want it to shrivel up and die. We want it to produce something. And then I found this on the internet. This is all the things they do to the wheat. I don't even know what some of those mean. What is stem elongation? What are internodes? Thing, there's no test. But it's a long, very process. And the farmer might be able to do it all. The farmer probably has helped with certain of these steps, especially the milling and processing. What happens next? Well, you got to take, after it's made into something the flour. We've got to bag it and we've got to seal the bag and we've got to send it out to the stores. We have to go shopping, we have to buy it. We take it home and then there's another whole process with the oven and baking and putting it together, mixing it together first. And, and if you're making just regular bread, it probably has a lot more ingredients. But of course, communion bread only has two ingredients, water and flour. And so we come up with a communion bread that is familiar to all of us. A lot of steps. The wine is the same way. There are a lot of steps to go from the seed to actually making wine and to get that wine here. And of course, it gets paid for by the contributions that we make to the parents. The priest says a prayer during this part, which you may or may not hear, because sometimes we sing a song. So he does these prayers to himself. But these are the two prayers over the bread and over the wine. He starts with, Bless the heart of the Lord, you have all things. Through your goodness, we have received the bread we offer or the wine we offer. It is fruit of the earth or fruit of the mind. But in both cases, it is the work of human beings. God and people working together. It's 
going to become the bread of life. It's going to become our spiritual journey. There's a lot to meditate just right there on the words of the man prayer. And what does it mean? So that's the question. What does it mean to me? What does this very long process and what we bring forward as gift and what happens to that gift? This whole process of this gift, this procession, everything that we do. What does it mean? We've got a little shot. Breaking a small gift to die is going to transform that gift. You know, if I can add on that. Sure. If, if he takes it, he brings it into himself and he gives it back to us. And he puts him in us. Yes. 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 You may or may not know that in the early church, People brought these gifts from their home. People brought bread that they could eat and wine that they could eat and brought it in to use at the Eucharist. So we can't quite do that, although there could be bread makers and wine makers among us, but we usually order them from the catalog. <laughs> and that's what we use. But what you just said, is the summary. And the summary I think is very important. God provided the seed, the soil, the water, the sun, everything that made it grow. We worked to nurture those plants and harvest them and get them all ready. We made wheat and grapes through another process into bread and wine. And we gave them back to God with thanksgiving for what God has given to us. God makes them into something new, the body and blood of Christ. And we receive the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. We receive it and we become the body and blood of Christ. As I said before, hands and feet and voice of Jesus in the world today. Otherwise, you know, he went up to heaven. He ascended into heaven. So we are Christ in the world. We are the body of Christ broken for one another. The blood of Christ poured out for one another. Because we have also taken off his cross. And we are trying to live as Christ in the world. And we're promising the speaker today that that's not going to hold from us. But we're going to realize that it's the work of the rest of our lives. And we're going to try from year to year, maybe from month to month, maybe from week to week. We're going to try to get a little bit better at it. Will we ever fail? Are you human? Yes. But all in all, you're going to make the intention 
we try to be Christ in the world. And that's what it's all about. Any questions? <laughs> Probably a lot of you does it, right? But I think we're all done. <laughs> we're out of time. We're not going to have a question. No, if you have a burning question, I don't want you to go to bed and say, she didn't say this. What didn't I say? Or what didn't I explain you all about? I was clear as mud. You might have to think about it. I bet you'll have questions as time goes on. Lord is a member of this parish, so we can always ask her. Because I have to go back to Minnesota. Uh, but she's pretty good at this stuff, too. And if she doesn't know it, she can email me. Yes? This is Rod. I think a lot of people take it for granted that at the beginning of the The mass is made up of, I don't even know how many I've ever come to them, little rituals that every one of them has a meaning, carrying up the gospel work. Just in the gospel world, not following the book. <laughs> um, every one of those things means something. And because we have these experiences and alcohol and we get into all sorts of other things, we don't necessarily reflect on it and say, what does that mean to me? And how do I take what I learn into the world? So, okay, let me say that. Because it tells you that. <laughs> or buy one copy and share it. <laughs> well, thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. You were willing to talk to each other and share. That's great. That's why I'm here. And thank you again. Thank you for coming on Friday night and letting me talk about my favorite. Thank you so much, Jackie, for helping us explore that, that seed that each one of us is. You are the only one who can participate as you to play your part in the past of the people who pray with the heavenly life. And so, again, thank you for coming. Yourself the gift of reflecting on the God who moved his out to us, who is ready to welcome us together in this prayer. Another piece of this Eucharistic uh, revival is we have our own mass and prayer for the Eucharistic revival. We see people from our community in this well. And I'd like to um, close with this prayer. Um, if you're interested in more about the Revival. There's information on the Diocese website, which is portlanddiocese.org. I know diocese is the word most people know how to spell, so feel free to ask me, and I'll be happy to, to get that to you. It's also usually have that in our parish bulletin as well as in our newsletter. But as we go, before we go forth this evening, let us pray together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And together, Jesus, the bread of life, and the of salvation, you gave us rich and sacred you gave us and the present and the consecrated of the Lord. What are we to do?
Thank you. Have a lovely day.